Rachel and I are going to try to do a little something for you this morning. So uh, you know how I feel about playing. Pray for me. Rachel uh, is going to sing His Eyes on the Sparrow, which is a long song, but it's really, really pretty, and it has so many beautiful words to it. So. Amen.
Thank you, Rachel and CC. Man, that makes you feel like you've been to church, doesn't it? <laughs> that was great. His eye is on the sparrow. Also, his eyes is on us too. You have your Bibles this morning. Turn with me over to the Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. Speaking on the subject of spoonful, spoonful of sunshine. Spoonful of sunshine. Begin reading with verse 19. Paul says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my ex ex earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life, or by that. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But I live in the but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. In this day that you and I are living in, we need some sunshine in our life. Now, I'm not talking about the sunshine that comes from the S-U-N, but I'm speaking about the spiritual sunshine of courage, cheerfulness, joy, and optimism that comes down from heaven. This is the sunshine that we so desperately need in our lives today. And thanks be to God, we all can have it. As I said last week as I preached about Noah, that I had the utmost respect for Noah being committed to God as he was. And today I have that same respect to the Apostle Paul for being committed to Christ as he was. And you will see as I develop the sermon, you will see how committed that Paul was to the Lord Jesus. As I was going to sleep last night, I thought, the reason that came to me as I was about to go to sleep it is lack of commitment upon the Christians in our churches. Lack of commitment. And Paul is a prime example for us that we should follow. Now, let me say this. Paul had uh, been a prisoner in Rome under Nero for four years. And even as a Roman prisoner, he lived in sunshine. He had not given up. He was not groping around in darkness. He had found the key to life and he was living in the sunshine. 
And I want to share with you this morning three or spoonfuls of sunshine. And if we will accept them and live by them, they are sure to brighten our days. And how we need to have our days brighten as we need it today. Now listen as I develop this sermon because it's very important to us. The first thing that we see as we read about Paul is that we must get our priorities in order. Get our priorities in order. Listen to Paul's testimony in verses 20 and 21 again. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is saying whether I live or whether I die is not the main issue here. He has his priorities in order and he is, in, he is determined to glorify Jesus Christ in whatever comes his way. And you can't fail to see that in, in Paul's life. He, he faced many uh, obstacles in his life, but he, he was determined to get his priorities straight and to glorify Jesus Christ whatever comes his way. His relationship with Jesus uh, uh, is so intimate that the two are inseparable. For Paul to continue to live and serve is for Jesus Christ to live through him. Now, Paul admits, however, that it would be to his advantage to go on home and be with Jesus. Dr. R.G. Lee, that great old man of God, I had a chance to meet Dr. Lee in the middle 70s. And uh, just to look at that man as I stood before him when I was introduced to him, he had a twinkle in his eyes like I have never seen anybody before. And that twinkle in his eyes showed me that this man knew the Lord Jesus Christ, was committed to the Lord Jesus Christ as Paul was committed here. And Dr. Lee had been talking about things spiritual one day and when he was asked, how real is Jesus to you? And I thought to myself, how in the world can you ask Dr. Lee uh, is Jesus, how real is he, is he to you? Well, I like what Dr. Lee said. He pointed to a chair and said, He is just as real to me as that chair. And that's what Paul is saying. Jesus was so real to Paul that uh, for him to live would be for Jesus to live in him. And he had settled that matter a long time ago uh, on, the, on his Damascus road, that Jesus Christ would be first in his life. Folks, I want to ask you, where are your priorities today? Your priority, folks, number one, it, it should be God. But I'm wondering, out across our world today, in, in Christian, I'm not saying that people are not saved. I'm not saying they're not born again. I'm not saying they're not going to heaven. But many Christians today do not have their priorities in order, and that's God first. Where did those amens go I heard in the beginning this morning? <laughs> you see, folks, pastoring is not easy. But God knows us better than anyone else. And when he leads me to something, he is not only speaking to us here, but I feel like he's speaking to people out across the world. As I said, Paul settled this question on Damascus Road some years before he had written this letter in Acts chapter 9. On his way to Jerusalem, to, to, to Damascus, he was on his way to persecute Christians. And this devout Jew met Jesus Christ in a startling and a miraculous way. And there he yielded his life to the Savior. Jesus saved him, called him to preach, filled his life with spiritual sunshine. And Paul was never the same ever again. Let me tell you something, folks. When I met Jesus Christ and accepted him as my personal Savior, when he called me to preach, I have never, ever been the same 
ever again. I don't like to use personal experiences, but when I was when I was surrendered to preach and uh, got my life straightened out with the Lord, I was standing at my desk at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, and one of the guys spoke to me and said, "There's something different about you. There's something different about you." And I said, "Yeah." I've recommitted my life to the Lord Jesus, and he's called me to preach. He said, I knew there, is some, there was something that was new about you. You see, Jesus had, had cleansed me, and, and I had finally surrendered to do what he wanted me to do and committed uh, to him. And Paul, I've never been the same ever since that time. This commitment to Jesus Christ gave Paul a sense of security uh, as he faced life and death issues there in prison. You see, Paul, as he was speaking about being joyful, being uh, cheerful, uh, he, he was facing death in a, in a Roman prison. You say, well, uh, all the time we say, well, oh, Paul uh, doesn't go through what we go. Well, listen, he was in prison. He'd been persecuted, but he says, as I face death, he said, I, I, I'd rather go on and go home and be with Jesus. That's my heart's desire. But he looked around and he said, but my, but my desire doesn't count. It is better for you that I stay here and minister uh, to you. That's how committed Paul was uh, to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I want not. What does he say there? He said, I, if I am going on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what I shall, what I shall choose, I do not know. Paul confessed that it would be far better for him to depart and be with Christ but he conceded it'd be better for those that he was speaking to that were uh, that he'd be spared that he could continue to work with them and minister to them. Whatever befell him, Paul says, I'm ready. No matter what comes my way, I'm ready. He had his priorities in order. Whatever it cost him, his mind was made up. He says he will stand firm in verse 20. What he was saying there in verse 20 is now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether I live or whether I die. And it was a radiant, glorious, and large spoon of sunshine uh, that the apostle served up here. Out of his own experience, he told us that our lives will be happier and brighter if we decided today to make Jesus Christ number one in our lives. Do this will guarantee to bring heaven's sunshine in one's life. I was thinking last night as I, I, as I was running things over in my mind. In many people's lives today, I, I, I come to the conclusion that God is about fourth. When well, he should be first. Should be first. But what we do, We have jobs, we have families, we have pleasures, and then there comes God. You say, Brother Jack, it's not right in my life. That's great. It's not. I'm just telling you that many Christians today do not have their priorities in order, and God knows it, and that's what he's trying to tell us today. I'm first and not last. Then say it. And he was saying, look at verses 22 through 24. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful uh, for you. He said, if I am going on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. He said, I don't know what to choose. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ.
which is far better from that. But it's necessary for me to stay in the body and minister to you. You see, here was a man who had come to the end of himself. Pride and selfish ambition no, it no longer drove him. Once they did, but when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he was so challenged by Jesus to live for something bigger than himself that it revolutionized his life and folks, it will revolutionize our lives also. <laughs> I, I read about this little, little, little illustration story. There was an elderly gentleman who prided himself on his ability as an art critic. And although he was very nearsighted, that didn't keep him from giving his opinion on the art at every opportunity. One day when he and his wife went with some friends to a large art gallery, the man seized his chance. Standing before a large framed portrait, he launched into his treatise on art. In the first place, he said, this frame is not in keeping with the subject. The frame is entirely too large for the face. As for the subject himself, he is far too homely to make a good picture. Psst, psst, his wife as she edged her way closer to him. Psst, John, psst, she kept hissing. But old John was so caught up in his role of art critic that he never heard her. He said it's a great mistake for any artist to choose a homely as so homely a subject for a picture. He can never expect to paint a masterpiece with such ugly subject. And again from behind him came the sound of his imploring, concerned wife, John. Psst, psst. But by now her calls were frantic. But old John just plowed on. He would have these poor dumbbells know just how sophisticated and urbane that he was. <coughs> now John continued authoritatively. If the artist had chosen a face with at least some character in his picture, his picture would be so much better. Psst, psst. John, his wife, called again. And by this time, she was at his side. And finally getting his attention, she whispered in his ear, For Pete's sake, John, shut up. You're looking in a mirror. <laughs> So many of us Christians today, we focus is inward. We spend our time and energies wondering how to impress others and draw more attention to ourselves. We never will live a full life until we give our life to Jesus and give it away to others. And that's what Paul did. He spent his life giving it away uh, to others. Then thirdly, we must face life with optimism. Paul's ringing exclamation of optimism, and I picture that it rattles the chains on his arms and startles the guard who was chained, chained to him. And convinced of this, he said, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Paul is saying, what I am teaching you, and if you apply to your life, joy will overflow because of what I'm teaching you. I read where Dr. W. Crystal was 18 years old, and, and he was a student at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, and he was called to be a pastor of the First Baptist Church of Devil's Bend, Texas. There was a church that had 41 members. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Crystal said there was an old pot-bellied stove in the middle of the room where the church met for worship. He said many of the men chewed tobacco back in those days, and they would chew until they were about to drown. And then he said then right in the middle of the service, they would get up, unhook the stove door, and spit, and sometimes nearly putting out the fire. But Dr. Crystal said he would preach on anyway. And he said, however, I long for the day when I would be able to pastor of a church that would have brass spit tunes. And Crystal's biographer wrote that, according to Crystal, on Saturday afternoons, the church at Devil's Bend held their business meeting. The beginners were always there and seated in full force on the front 
road. Dr. Christmas said, told now on one Saturday, a member stood up and said, My brothers, I make a motion we build a fence around the cemetery. Another member stood up and shouted, I'm against it. And when the againer was asked why he was against the fence, he gave his reason. He said, Do you know anybody in the cemetery who can get out? Nobody said anything. He said, Do you know anybody on the outside who wants to get in? Nobody said anything. He said, Then why then should we build a fence around the cemetery? Today, some Christians live as though they want to get in the cemetery. And some are already there, filled with pessimism, defeated, joyous. Nothing ever seems to go right in their life. Everybody is against them, whipped and discouraged, and they drag through life head with heavy steps and long faces. Like Mr. Muckrake in Pilgrim's Progress, they go through life downcast with downcast eyes, hardly ever looking up. And that's about the best way I know to wind up permanently in a cemetery. Paul learned that he could not live well or effectively unless he clung to the optimism and had that kind of outlook uh, on life. But Paul's optimism wasn't shallow. It was based on his faith in Jesus Christ. And through Paul, though Paul had been a prisoner for four long years, his voice still wrong with optimism. He said, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. In verse 25. That was a man who was not defeated. <clears throat> Today we must learn a lesson from Paul. But listen to me. We have the choice. We can face life uh, defeated or with courage. It's up to you. You make that choice. But looking at life through dark glasses won't improve it one degree. Actually, it will work against us. Facing the hard realities of life in faith and optimism will help us handle whatever comes our way. Whatever it may be. Our work will go better. Our play will be better. Our night's rest will be better. And life will take an aura of brightness and sunshine that we never thought possible. But the choice is ours. My choice and your choice. I don't know about you. You've got to make that choice, not me. But my choice is to make Jesus Christ number one in my life. That's where my priority lies. No one comes before the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the way that it was with Paul. Let me close by saying this. Jesus can change our dreary, defeated, sin of uh, chained lives, fill us with the Holy Spirit, and the radiant, victorious, spiritual sunshine He gives. But we must be Him. We must let Him do it. There was a woman one time that had the ambition to walk from New York City to Miami, Florida. It was a most difficult undertaking, but she did it. And when she reached Miami and was asked by a reporter how she managed to do it, she said all she had to do was take one step at a time. After she took the first step, which was the hardest step of all, she took another and another and another. The same thing is true for all of, of all of us who live above the dismal shadows of life. To walk on the sunny side of life begins with the first step, then another step, then another step unreserved commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that step, it's sunshine all the way, even when the shadows fall. Holy commitment. And folks, for the churches of 2013, to mean anything to the outside world, we must be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ totally. And when we do that, we can live with joy and peace and tranquility in our lives. But there must be commitment. That's for the Father. I pray, Lord, that we would all check our priorities today. 
And I pray, Lord, that all of us can say that you are number one on that list for our hearts. You are, are no one before you, Lord. You're on the highest pinnacle of our hearts. And I know, Lord, that we, we must commit ourselves to you like Paul did to make a difference in our society today. When people can see that those who are in the church can see that dedication and that commitment to the Lord Jesus as Paul committed his life. Father, I pray for decisions to be made in this place today. Holy Spirit, God, you know who you're moving upon to make a decision. You are moving on people, Lord, to make you on the highest pinnacle of their heart and be on the highest priority in their lives. And who knows, Lord, only you know that there may be someone who needs to recommit their life today as a child of God. Come and say, I want to make Jesus number one in my life. I want to rededicate my life to you, Jesus, and do more for you tomorrow than I did yesterday. And maybe someone here today, Lord, is lost and never given their life to Christ. I pray, Holy Spirit, you prick that heart and point through the cross at Calvary. And let them see the blood of Jesus that he shed on that cross that day that will wash away all of their sins and he will forgive them and they can spend eternity uh, with the Lord Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. What number? Right. 187. 187. You have a decision to make. You can't make that decision right now. <clears throat> Christ first in your life, praise God for you. But folks, it's going to take us all being committed like Paul was to the Lord Jesus and for this church to move forward the way that God wants it to move. There must be commitment. I know a lot of you are here every time the church doors open. I praise God for that. You're committed. We all need to be committed that way. God sent us here to do a job. And folks, I'm going to do it. As long as he give me breath to do. I'm going to preach his word. I'm going to preach what he places upon my heart. I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm just telling you what God told me. I want Rachel to sing one other verse. Is your priorities right with God first? If he's not, you need to get him straight back.
Michael, wait a minute. Brother Tim has something he wants to say. I just want to.